Right, let's get going then. Um, it's a huge pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. It's okay, I didn't notice. So okay. <laughs> um, Tony Phillips has enjoyed a long career in speech radio as a documentary maker, producer, and editor. After initially training as an actor, you did tell me that, Tony. He joined the BBC with the purpose of allowing marginalised voices to be heard, especially in the context of telling the history and experiences of Black Britain. In the course of his career, he's interviewed the likes of Betty Shabazz, widow of Malcolm X, and Rosa Parks. He's been the commissioning editor for BBC World Service and Radio 4, and was responsible for commissioning The Listening Project, which many people will, will, will know if they listen to BBC Radio, which was inspired by StoryCorps that some of our friends from the US will be familiar with. He was also Vice President at WNYC Studios in New York and Broccoli Content Sony in the UK. In recent years, he's focused much of his work on the phenomenon of the podcast. Throughout a rich and varied career, he's devoted himself to the telling of stories, stories of personal experience that speak to a wider collective truth. But whilst creating platforms for previously unheard voices, his concern is also with the act and art of listening, which was the focus of his recently successful doctoral research. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Tony Phillips. That's the first time I've been called Doctor. <laughs> Apart from my youngest daughter, who says things like, my leg hurts, can you help? <laughs> anyway, listen, I'll crack on. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm so thrilled and honoured to have been invited. So thank you both very much. I was born in Leeds. That's me. I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail later on. But um, know that um, I was born, as I say, in Leeds. My parents are from the Caribbean, from a small Caribbean island called St. Kitts. And a sister island called Nevis, I have to say that. Um, I grew up the youngest of four boys. And my main passion, my biggest passion perhaps, was football. Uh, and my beloved Leeds United. And I'd like to think that Leeds, and Leeds United in particular, shaped my life. But sadly, because we were very good all the time, other forces played far more important roles, steering and giving focus to my life. And it was in fact drama school, uh, more, specifically the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, um, that in many ways kind of gave me some focus and some direction. Uh, it was one class in particular when I was at drama school, there was about 20 students in my class um, and we had a fantastically idiosyncratic and wonderful Prussian movement and drama teacher called Rudy Shelley. He taught many, many eminent actors like um, Daniel Day-Lewis and Samantha Bond and me. Yeah. And uh, some of them went on to have really successful careers on stage. And I, I often look at them and think, what was I thinking? You know, what was I thinking trying to do this? But anyway, I did do it for a little bit. But in this one particular class, we were doing two-handers. And it was a King Lear scene, and I think it was a scene on the heath, and it was Lear and the Fool. And there was one of my colleagues, one of my fellow actors, uh, I'm going to name him, called Dougal Lee. And Dougal was tall, he was about six foot two, he had a beard, he had a bass voice, he was just huge. And I was always in awe of this voice, because he had this voice and I had my voice. And I figured that, well, that's the way to be an actor. But Rudy pulled him up short and said, stop, 
stop. And I think Dougal was expecting praise to be heaped upon him. And Rudy said, Dougal, you are in love with the sound of your own voice. <laughs> um, and what he meant, what he really meant was that in this two-hander, Dougal was kind of acting and acting and acting. And then when the other person spoke, there was a little moment which Rudy caught, where Dougal was effectively, he wasn't actually doing this, but he was effectively doing this. <laughs> waiting for his turn to come back. And then he was going to act some more. And what Rudy then explained, and I like to think that he said it for my benefit, Rudy said, acting is about the art of reacting. That's all you need to know. So when you're not speaking, you've got to give to the other person. Otherwise the scene won't work. And even if it's just a momentary kind of little glance away, it can kind of draw the scene away from the other person towards you. Now, that lesson kind of guided me throughout my entire career and continues to. So I left drama school, I worked for a little bit, a um, couple of years, then I went to university. I have to say, I acted a lot. I was actually not bad. I just like to say that. <laughs> so I went to, I went to university and, uh, and I studied, but eventually I ended up at the BBC on a training course. And as I say, it's this, this maxim of acting being the art of reacting that guided pretty much every interview that I did. And um, Rudy was in my voice and continues to be in my voice a lot. And when you're doing interviews, you never quite know what someone is prepared to share with you. You never quite know when they choose to go silent. And you never quite know when they're going to tell you something that they didn't expect to tell you. All it meant is that I had to be on my toes, listening, focused. I had to be with them pretty much every step of the way. So there was one interview early in my career. In fact, it was the idea that I pitched to the BBC to get into the BBC was about Windrush. Back then, we didn't really use the phrase Windrush generation. It was just Windrush. It was this boat that carried 493 Caribbean people, mainly Jamaicans, to Britain in 1948. And I, I pitched an idea to the BBC comparing the Caribbean experience in Britain to the Caribbean experience in the United States. And I ended up speaking to a man in Coventry, not far from here, 45 minutes down the road, a man called Oliver. And Oliver had a cousin in Brooklyn and I, I spoke to them both. And what I wanted Oliver to, to tell me is, did he really, really want to come to England? Or did he really want to go to the United States with his cousin? Now, the research that I'd done at university would suggest that actually Britain wasn't the first choice. Britain might not have been the mother country that every Caribbean person, my parents' generation and many others wanted to come to. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that other places were far higher on the agenda. But nevertheless, I couldn't force Oliver to say this, but after a good few hours and then suddenly through tears, Oliver said, I didn't want to come to England at all. It was hard. I wanted to go to America. And then he, he spoke at great length about the litany of disappointments that he's had from discrimination to, well, everything, largely discrimination. I didn't expect that. 
especially through the tears. In another interview with one of Malcolm X's daughters, I was doing a documentary about her father's personal effects disappearing, but they turned up on eBay and they were, they were about to be auctioned up. All his letters, all his diaries, his personal effects, even his suits and his shoes. Now I found out through a visit to the Schomburg in Harlem, the library and museum and cultural center, that all this stuff had just sort of ended up in the wrong hands. And um, I wanted to make a documentary about how all this stuff was being recovered and how the city and the city library stepped in, bought the stuff off eBay and returned it to New York City for safekeeping. Now I met one of his daughters, one of his six daughters. I met his third daughter, Ilyasa, and I said to her, listen, I can't make this documentary without one of the daughters, without one of the family commenting on this. So she agreed um, because I gave her very little choice. I turned up at a book signing she was doing and I basically did what journalists call doorstepping. And I knew that I'd got about 30 seconds with her. And so I made my accent a little more British than it normally is. And she did the thing that a lot of Americans do when, you know, when we go to America, they say, oh my God, your ass is amazing. <laughs> yes. So I knew that I hooked her in. And then she was like, well, what do you want? And I said, I need you. I need to talk to you. I need to record with you. And we did. We ran around New York for about a day. She introduced me to family friends. We ate together. We laughed. And I was leading up to taking her back to the Schomburg to sit in a very small room with some of her father's possessions. And she was fine until the door was closed. And we were in a, like a phone booth size room. And there were letters, a few letters, and um, a copy of her father, in fact, her father's Quran, purple, leather bound. And as soon as the door closed, she started to stroke this Quran. And she said to me one thing. She said, do you expect me to say something now? So I said, if you want to speak, that's fine. If you don't want to speak, that's fine too. So we sat in silence. And all you could hear was the air conditioning, the hum of activity outside this little corral. And we sat like that for about 10 minutes. That's about 10 seconds. And I wasn't gonna make the first move. I decided, well, she wants to be here, and I want her to be here, so if she wants to go, that's fine. But let me see if I can just hold the stare, hold the look. And she held the look, and we looked at each other for a long time, then she'd look away. And then I was reading this letter upside down, and I could see that it said, Hajj, Mecca. 1964, and I'm like, oh, turn it around, and eventually she did, and she said, well, this is just a letter from my father to my mother, 1964, oh. then she started to read it, and it was as if she hadn't read it before. I think she had read it before, but for some reason this time it meant something else. And she read this and it was moving and it was fine. And she, she was basically saying, here, listen to this, listen to this. And there was one bit she said, 
Listen, this is my father. My father said he's saying this. And Malcolm is saying from Matthew. Betty, I've ordered a new car. It's a blue Chevrolet or something. It's going to arrive before I get back. But I've ordered it. I've instructed the people not to allow you to drive it <laughs> because you'll only crash it. <laughs> In brackets, smile. Huh. And then she was like, oh my God, this is so funny. This is beautiful. She finished this letter by basically saying, this is amazing. This is so lovely. If a, if a, if a man wrote that to you, you would just fall in love with this man. You would fall in love. So the mood had shifted, everything moved. We got the interview, we got some words on tape. But I didn't expect that. I didn't expect this kind of silent, it wasn't quite a battle, but it was. But I knew that she wanted to be there. Anyway, we got some. Um, there was another one when I met Rosa Parks. I did a talk when I was living in New York at a university called Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I loved going to, I went a couple of times. Rutgers is amazing because the kids there are not like kids from NYU or Columbia. These kids, these kids are from humble backgrounds. And when I mentioned that I'd met Rosa Parks, it was a kind of, what? You, you, how, how old are you? <laughs> but when we met, I went there with my oldest brother. We asked her a question. Of course, we were there to talk about the Montgomery bus boycott, December the 1st, 1955. And I thought long and hard about this, that what I wanted was to her to tell me what happened in her words. I didn't really want to go in there and say, yeah, 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 you were, you did the bus boycott. Like, you know, I know. Well, actually, I wanted her to tell you how it was for her. And the way we'd asked the question was basically an invitation for her to take whatever space she wanted, whatever angle she wanted. And when we asked, she said this. Almost her first response was, I've done it before, you know, at which point, my brother and I sort of looked at each other and said, excuse me? And she said, yes, I've done it before. She went on to explain some date, 1943, same bus, same driver. Which raises all sorts of questions. Why don't we know this? And one of the reasons we don't know it, I, I guess, is that interviewers possibly go in telling the interviewee how much they know, which is understandable to a certain degree, but also potentially fatal. If you really want to find out something new, you have to give people the space to tell their story. And she did. And it was a remarkable thing because I haven't really seen it or heard it. I've certainly not heard it. But all of these encounters are the direct result of listening, different types of listening, hopeful listening, on the precipice listening, revelatory listening. And one of the delights of my career was being invited to be the series producer of the brief lectures. These are lectures that the BBC has been doing going back to 1948. The first lecturer was Bertrand Russell. I came on board in 2005, six, and in 2006, I was serious producing the musician and conductor Daniel Barrenboy, who was somebody that I knew of a little bit, but he's somebody that you will never forget if you've been in his company. Uh, Barrenboy, is an extraordinary individual. And he set up, he co-established an orchestra with Edward Said, the academic and writer. And this orchestra is called the Western, the East, 
the Western East Divan Orchestra. I probably messed that up, probably the other way around. Um, and the idea behind the orchestra is to allow Muslim, young Muslims, young Arabs, and young Jews to play together. The orchestra is made up entirely of young Arabs and young Jews. Now, Baron saw the orchestra like this. You've got 90 people, maybe 100 people, and you're all here to play a particular piece of music. But it will only work if this person over here listens to the narrative of this person over here. In other words, the cellist up there has to listen to the triangle player over, over here. In other words, you have to listen to the narrative of the other. And for Baron Boyman, this orchestra, he sometimes said, well, in this orchestra, the perception is you have to listen to the narrative of your enemy your perceived enemy. And that's how you get the beauty. That's how you get the art. And in radio and podcasting terms, that's how you get the good stuff. So you have to listen. And that's what I learned from Ruby going all, all those years back. Um, there was a recce. I had to go and test the venues when I was working with Baron Boy. The final two lectures were, were going to be in Jerusalem. Actually, one in, one in Jerusalem and he wanted one on the West Bank. So I had to go to the West Bank with a, with a studio manager to look at a few venues, to listen to a few venues. Is it going to work? So we were dropped by a BBC Stringer at a checkpoint to go into Ramallah. We looked at a few venues, Mosaic University, the Quaker School. When we came back, he dropped us at a different checkpoint because our driver, our BBC driver, who's an Arab Israeli, said, the other checkpoint is now blocked. Go to this one. We went to that one. When we got to the checkpoint, um, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do. So I phoned him. I said, well, what do I do? He said, just walk over the bridge. The bridge is about 80 yards long. I said, okay. So our Ramallah guy, he went. I phoned the taxi driver for the BBC, and like all taxi drivers, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm just here. <laughs> he wasn't there at all. So I said, well, what am I doing? He said, just walk over. So we walked over. We took, we, we took maybe three or four steps onto the bridge, and it was just cars and lorries rumbling by. But I could sense something. I could hear something. And Simon, the studio manager, couldn't hear a thing. And I said, no, 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 I can hear something. Did you hear that? No. What I could hear was somebody saying something. So I stopped. And at the far end of the bridge, all I could see was a rifle pointing straight at us. And a soldier saying, stop, turn around, walk off the bridge. Simon started to shake. This is where drama school helped. <laughs> I took a massive intake of breath. I flexed my diaphragm and I said, our car is on the other side. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. Anyway, the, um, the soldier heard and he replied and he said, stop. Turn around, get off the bridge. So, turn around and went off the bridge. Simon was incredibly impressed that I could speak above the traffic. But of course, you know, back of the stalls, darlings, back of the stalls. So, it came in handy. But essentially, the drama school helped to save my life, quite literally. Uh, that when we got over to Jerusalem uh, to the British Council, the British Council casually said, oh yeah, there was a UN truck that was fired at two days earlier. They got two bullets through the windscreen because they, they failed to stop 
before they got into the British, like those American stop signs. You're supposed to pause and then they didn't do that, so they shot through the windscreen. This picture, by the way, um, I was about nine and I was determined to go to Ellen Road to see Leeds United versus Manchester United. And I went. You'll notice. There's probably not any of my family around. That's because I lied to my mother and I said I was going with a friend. And I went and I spent the whole afternoon watching George Best. That's all I was doing. You'll also notice that everyone is looking the other way. Yeah, they were looking at something boring called the game. <laughs> I decided to, to just study George Best. So that's what I did all afternoon. Wherever he went, that was the narrative I was interested in. That was my story for the afternoon. Apart from getting home and getting into some serious trouble uh, with my mother and my brothers who just thought it was the funniest thing ever. Perhaps they were worried, but anyway. That's what happened. Um, I, I only wanted to, to say that, to, to, to show you this largely because it has in so many ways characterized my career as well. Of just finding, finding my own path, finding my own narrative and following that, even if it gets you into a little bit of trouble. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm very happy to take questions, but for now, thank you.